On March 4th, 2020, viewers of AEW Dynamite were astonished by the unexpected appearance of Jake the Snake Roberts, a legend that etched his place in pro wrestling lore through his spellbinding soliloquies and mastery of human psychology. And what do you know, when Roberts hit the ring to confront Cody Rhodes, he morphed into the Jake of old, disturbing Dusty's son with unfiltered put-downs and the foreboding threat that somebody was coming to put him out of his misery. It was textbook Jake, creating buzz through his measured delivery and serious tone. Through many trials and tribulations, his potent gift of gab has never left him. I'm Jack from Cultaholic.com and this is the captivating career of Jake the Snake Roberts. The son of Grizzly Smith first got involved in the wrestling business in his late teens, working for Mid-South as a referee. By the fall of 1975, Roberts was working for Eddie Graham's Championship Wrestling from Florida, under the name Jake Smith Jr. By 77, he began using the Roberts surname, which obviously would have lasting power. He continued picking up experience both in St. Louis and Central States Wrestling, as well as some shots in the Houston Territory come early 1978. Not long after, Roberts moved into Vancouver's All-Star Wrestling for a lengthy run and falling short in a bid against NWA Pacific Coast heavyweight champion Gene Kaniski. In early 79, Roberts turned up in Calgary Stampede Wrestling, where he went on to feud with the territory's North American champion Big Daddy Ritter, eventually to be known as the Junkyard Dog. That April, Roberts defeated Ritter to capture the title and held it well into the summer. During his reign, Roberts fended off challenges including Ritter as well as Hercules Ayala. He also fell short in his challenge of NWA World Heavyweight Champion Harley Race that July. Weeks after the bout with Race, Roberts dropped his belt to Ritter in a ladder match, a curiosity that later made it onto a 2007 WWE DVD release. Not long after the loss to Ritter, Roberts emerged in Mid-South Wrestling. Though he fell short against North American champion The Grappler in September of 1980, he went on to defeat Johnny Mantell for the Louisiana title three weeks later in the city of Shreveport. He spent months holding off challenges from the likes of Stan Lane, Paul Ellering and Stan Hansen before dropping the gold to Big Cat Ernie Ladd in January of 1981. In the months ahead, Roberts continued to chase The Grappler North American title and finally won it that May. Take that, the grappler, you big grappler. It was in this period that Roberts claims to have invented the DDT, albeit by accident after holding Grappler in a front face lock and slipping, causing him to instead fall backwards. This story, however, has been questioned by many. But as for Roberts' reign, it proved short-lived and he dropped it to Paul Orndorff inside the Superdome on Independence Day. Roberts finished up in Mid-South at the end of July and moved over to Mid-Atlantic, where he would spend the next year of his career. That run didn't yield any gold, but Roberts worked with many top names in the business, defeating Greg Valentine on a Christmas night card in 1981 and unsuccessfully challenging title holders like NWA World Champion Ric Flair and US Champion Sergeant Slaughter. During his tenure, Roberts also teamed with Wahoo McDaniel in a loss to Abdullah the Butcher and Roddy Piper in a Falls Count Anywhere match at the Norfolk Scope. Roberts returned to Florida in August of 1982, where he was immediately embroiled in a feud with a young Barry Windham. Roberts defeated his fellow second-generation wrestler in a death match the following month in Jacksonville, but their war raged on. The two were often on opposite sides of Tornado and Bunkhouse tag matches in the months ahead, and Windham thwarted his rival in a taped fist match that November. Roberts also feuded with Dusty Rhodes when the American Dream was shrouded under the mask of the Midnight Rider. By March 83, Roberts re-emerged in Mid-Atlantic, where he would spend the next six months of of his career. It was on to Georgia Championship Wrestling that fall, and there, Roberts became part of Paul Ellering's Greater Legion of Doom faction, along with obviously the Road Warriors, the Spoiler, King Kong Bundy, Matt Bourne, and others. That November, Roberts defeated Ronnie Garvin to win the NWA National TV title inside Atlanta's Omni. Roberts often saved his title in defenses by taking cheap DQ and countout finishes before finally dropping the gold back to Garvin in a lights out match in April 84. He regained the belt that June, but lost it back to Garvin just weeks later, just as Roberts was about to leave the territory. Not long after, he turned up in Dallas's world-class championship wrestling, home of the revered Von Eric family. And it didn't take long for Roberts to run afoul of the local royalty, teaming with Chris Adams and Gino Hernandez to battle the brothers. In late October of 84, Roberts teamed with Adams and Hernandez to win world class's six-man tag team titles from the Von Erichs at Dallas's Cotton Bowl. In the months ahead, Roberts wrestled against the Von Erichs in various combinations before his team dropped the belts back to the trio on New Year's Eve in Fort Worth, Texas. As the calendar flipped to 1985, Roberts returned to Mid-South where he battled Terry Taylor over the promotion's TV title just in his first few months back. At the Superdome show on June 1st that year, Roberts had himself a celebrity brush where he was drilled with several punches by none other than Muhammad Ali. That was during Roberts' challenge of then-television champion the Snowman, 
bloody snowman? What's he like? Before finishing up with the territory for good in early 86, Roberts feuded with Dick Slater, defeating him for the North American title that January, but Slater would get it back three weeks later. Roberts then did what many top territory stars of the era before him had done, made tracks for New York City. Jake the Snake made his WWF debut in March 1986, bringing with him his trusty python Damien. Establishing himself as an icy villain, one that didn't need to maniacally rant and rave like many of his peers, Roberts quickly guzzled up the jobbers before him and defeated George Wells in the undercard of WrestleMania 2. His first major rivalry came with Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, whom Roberts legitimately knocked out by DDTing his head onto the unpadded floor. Steamboat began bringing a Komodo dragon to the ring with him as a counter to Damien. I'm not sure how that works in the food chain, but we'll trust his judgment. And Roberts went on to lose to Steamboat in a series of snake pit matches, both at Toronto's big event and on Saturday night's main event. Despite playing such a malevolent and underhanded character, Roberts struck a chord with part of the audience. In a heel versus heel IC title match against champion Macho Man Randy Savage, fans overwhelmingly cheered for the serpent like Roberts. An angle in which Roberts DDT WWF champion Hulk Hogan on his snake pit talk show set never aired because fans would cheer Roberts and chant DDT and you can't have Hulk Hogan not be the most popular man in the ring. Roberts was ultimately turned face and feuded with the honky tonk man who battered Jake with a guitar on one snake pit episode, legitimately causing serious neck problems for Roberts. But the two faced off at WrestleMania 3 with rock icon Alice Cooper in Roberts' corner, but Honky was able to eke out the victory. Roberts later feuded with Honky Tonk Man after the latter won the IC Championship, but by the spring of 1988, he transitioned into a feud with ravishing Rick Rude. It all began when Rude put the moves on a woman in the front row of a TV taping, only for her to rebuff his advances. It was revealed that the woman was Cheryl Roberts, Jake's wife, and Roberts stormed the ring to prevent the embarrassed Rude from harming her. Rude took to wearing special airbrush tights that had Cheryl's face emblazoned over his nether regions, which caught Jake's ire, of course. On one occasion, Roberts actually stripped Rude's tights off during an episode of Superstars in the summer of 1988. The two battled on house shows well into the fall, with Roberts defeating Rude in a match at Madison Square Garden, where you could only win with your finisher. He then moved on to another Bobby Heenan client, one Andre the Giant, who interfered in a match between Roberts and Rick Rude. To get even, Roberts threw Damien at a horrified Andre, who sold the encounter by acting as though he'd had a heart attack. Andre brutalized Jake at the 1988 Survivor Series, and in the following year's Royal Rumble, an eliminated Roberts used Damien to scare Andre into eliminating himself from the match. The two faced off at WrestleMania 5, where Jake won, albeit by DQ. Ted DiBiase insinuated himself into the match at WrestleMania 5, and thus Roberts transitioned into a feud with him afterwards. When DiBiase feigned the flu to get out of a match with Jake, he chose Virgil as his surrogate. But a suddenly healthy, it's a miracle, a suddenly healthy DiBiase attacked Roberts after the match, badly wrenching his neck with the million dollar dream to put the snake out of action. Roberts returned over four months later to resume the feud, during which he stole the million dollar title and put it in his bag with Damien, daring DiBiase to come and get it. They had their final showdown at WrestleMania six, with DiBiase winning by count out, though Roberts did DDT him afterwards before giving a wad full of his money to some ringsiders at the Sky Dome. Roberts moved on to Bad News Brown, who, like many other heels, handily demonstrated a fear of snakes. Brown's plan to counter Damien was to bring a crate full of Harlem sewer rats to SummerSlam 1990, which Eric Rowan presumably watched as a child and took furious notes. Roberts won via DQ and moved on to Rick the Model Martel, who blinded Roberts in one eye with his cologne atomizer, which John Moxley presumably watched as a kid and furious took notes. Roberts regained his sight in time for WrestleMania 7, where he went on to defeat Martel in a special blindfold match, catching the model with the DDT. Roberts' next rival was Earthquake, who found a rather disquieting way to take Damien out of the equation. Simply squash him flat while making Jake watch. Armed with a new python named Lucifer, Roberts battled Earthquake over the coming months. But suddenly, gears would shift. Roberts turned heel, devilishly tricking the Ultimate Warrior while ostensibly training him for battle with The Undertaker. When Warrior was fired from WWF after SummerSlam 91, Roberts moved on to Randy Savage, who was retired at the time. After he and Undertaker crashed Savage's wedding to Miss Elizabeth, Roberts goaded Savage from a distance. This led to Savage being beaten down in the ring by Roberts, who then wedged the Macho Man in the ropes and in an unforgettable and iconic visual, sicked a cobra onto him. Savage was reinstated as an active wrestler and had a furious brawl with Roberts at the This Tuesday in Texas pay-per-view in December 91. Savage won, but Roberts got revenge by DDTing him three times after the match. He teased bringing out another cobra and made Miss Elizabeth beg on her unconscious husband's behalf before shocking everybody by striking her in the face, leading to Jake's creepy 
creepiest promo ever just minutes later. When Undertaker later stopped Roberts from harming Elizabeth on Saturday night's main event the next year, the two macabre characters were on a collision course for WrestleMania 8. Undertaker won, of course, it was WrestleMania, and Roberts, who had secured his release from WWF before the match, left the company after a six-year run. Four months later, Roberts suddenly showed up in WCW, laying out number one contender Sting with his patented DDT. Aligned with Cactus Jack and the Barbarian, Roberts faced off with Sting in numerous singles and tag matches on the house show circuit, as the road was paved to the 1992 edition of Halloween Havoc. Roberts headlined the event against Sting in a match that would be determined by the spin of a wheel. How fun! Sadly, the wheel landed on the very less exciting coal miners glove match and the two sworn enemies faced off in a boring weapon on a pole bout, which was won by Sting. After the events, Roberts left WCW less than three months after debuting. Over the next couple of years, Roberts barnstormed through various American and international indies. In the fall of 93, he wrestled a handful of non-tournament matches during the annual G1 Climax, facing the likes of Shinya Hashimoto and Satoshi Kojima. He'd also make an impact in AAA down in Mexico, causing the retirement of Conan and kicking off a year-long feud that culminated in a reinstated Conan, defeating him in a hair versus hair match in Tijuana. Roberts also won the Smoky Mountain Wrestling Heavyweight title from Tony Anthony in May of 94, but a handful of no-shows resulted in the belt being returned to Anthony later that summer. Roberts spent all of 1995 on the sidelines, around which time he became a born-again Christian. He returned to the WWF at the dawn of 96, now seconded by a new python named Revelations, and entered into the Royal Rumble match. His struggles with alcohol and substances were referenced in story, with his newfound faith said to have helped him beat those issues. He fell just short in the 96 King of the Ring tournament to Steve Austin, the post-match of which became the stuff of legend for the Rattlesnake. He went on to feud with Jerry Lawler, who mocked his drinking problem at every turn. After losing to Lawler at SummerSlam, Roberts went on to beat him in a match on Raw after feigning drunkenness to catch the King off guard. Roberts departed from the WWF around March 97 and began wrestling for various indies, including a one-off match at ECW's November to Remember in 1998, teaming with Tommy Dreamer against Just Incredible and Jack Victory. His appearances became more sporadic and less notable, with one glaring exception. In October 99, Roberts took part in a special Legends pay-per-view called Heroes of Wrestling, and without mincing words, Roberts was clearly intoxicated. His pre-match promo and subsequent performance in the main event gained equal infamy, as he was obviously in no state to perform, leaving Yokozuna, Jim Neidhart, and King Kong Bundy to somehow try and salvage things. Roberts was also a focus of the documentary Beyond the Mat, which also didn't show him in the most flattering of lights. In 2001, Roberts moved to Great Britain, wrestling regularly in promotions such as All Star Wrestling and NWA UK Hammerlock. He even started his own promotion called Real Stars of Wrestling in 2002, although that was very short-lived. Roberts finished his time across the pond at a World Association of Wrestling card in October 2004, but once again, he was in an unsuitable state for wrestling and skirmished with several wrestlers as he drunkenly tried to pay tribute to the recently departed Ray Trailer. After a few more years of ongoing struggles, Roberts moved into the home of his old protege, Diamond Dallas Page, in October 2012. During their time together, Roberts, who now weighed in excess of 300 pounds, began to get healthy. He dropped over 50 pounds while training with Page and received necessary shoulder surgery. The transformation was astounding, and shortly after getting healthy, Roberts re-emerged on WWE television at the end of a special old-school episode, draping one of his many snakes over the face of a dazed Dean Ambrose. Three months later, Roberts was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame by DDP himself. Roberts has actually wrestled a few matches in his 60s at various independents throughout North America. His most recent bout came in August of 2018, taking part in a six-man tag team match at an event in Winnipeg. One year later, Roberts played a supporting role in the movie The Peanut Butter Falcon, in which he wrestles a match against lead actor Zach Gottsagen. Roberts went on to make a few appearances as a talking head in different AEW video packages before coming aboard, as mentioned at the start of this video, as a manager. In Roberts' first promo back inside the ring, he noted the long road it took him to ultimately achieve sobriety. Roberts' return promo struck a chord with several generations of fans. Older ones who were thrilled to see that Roberts could still captivate, and younger fans who may not have been familiar with Jake's prime, but gained understanding into what makes the man special. Like many double-edged artists and stars, Roberts' brilliance and his struggles alike have been laid bare for all to see. His legacy might be a mixed one, but as his recovery demonstrated, there are many that continue to root for him to finally conquer his demons. Both the wrestler in the ring and the man outside possess the ability to make you believe in their story, whether the struggle was scripted or real. No matter his age, Jake the Snake Roberts remains, and may continue to remain, pro wrestling's pre-eminent storyteller.